This is Bigger Questions with your host, Robert Martin. Welcome to Bigger Questions. Today's big question, why can't I see God? Now, we usually record bigger questions before a live audience in Melbourne's CBD. Instead, I'm at the Doherty Institute in the inner north of Melbourne. My guest today is Dr. Tim Hinks. Tim is a trained physician from the UK with a PhD in immunology of the lungs. He's been working for the last two years as a postdoctoral fellow at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity in Parkville. He's about to return to the UK to begin a role at Oxford University, but before he returns, we found some time where I could ask him some bigger questions. So, Tim, welcome to Bigger Questions. Hi, Rob. It's great to be here. Yeah, terrific. Now, Tim, you work as a postdoctoral fellow in infection and immunity. So, what specifically are you researching? So I'm studying the immune system of the lungs. Um, So I trained as a chest physician. That's a doctor who works with people who've got problems with their lungs. Yeah. I've always been fascinated by science, but even just in the last 15 years since I qualified, in other branches of medicine, I've seen huge progress, Mm -hmm. dramatic changes. Um, And I've been frustrated that the same hasn't happened in in my field until very recently. Uh, And most of those advances have come from immunology. So how white blood cells in our body fight infection, and that can save us from cancers and from infections. Um, But currently I'm studying um, how the body fights um, Legionnaire's disease. And I've also been studying things like tuberculosis. Um, The aim of my life really would be to use science to develop new treatments and cures for those important global health diseases. And make a big impact in the world. Yeah, I'd love to be able to do that. Mm. Now, there's actually a YouTube video of you performing a bronchoscopy procedure. Now, I must confess, I get a bit squeamish with needles and I actually couldn't watch all of the video. So what were you doing in the procedure? So if you Google look inside the lungs, um, that would be the top um, hit on YouTube. And yeah. It's had 1.2 million views. Yeah. M- my participant, Tom, was taking part in one of my research projects studying asthma, and he took the day off work to come and have a flexible camera um, put down his throat under light sedation. And um, through that, we can take pictures inside the lungs and we can take samples. We used um, brushes and little two millimeter cutting forceps with gold tips, which give me samples which I can take back to the lab and then I uh, break them up into single cells and I label them with antibodies which glow in the dark and I run them through a machine with multiple lasers and I can measure each of those cells individually and sort them into dishes at the rate of 10,000 cells a second. So it's great to be able to go from a whole patient or a human like Tom (laughs) to um, some data analysis which gives us new insights into what causes asthma. So Tim, you're a scientist and a researcher. What, What do you love about it? Well, as I said, science is exciting. It's hard, and day to day it's pretty hard work, and we're in a competitive environment. But when you stand back and look at the big picture, um, it's great. Uh, The scientists I work with are driven by a genuine passion for their work, making new discoveries. It's fun, you get to play with bronchoscopes, microscopes, antibodies, lasers. I've been showing you a series of nasty um, bacteria in the lab, which I'm culturing up. And it's beautiful too. Um, Sometimes we take pictures um, using immunofluorescence, which are um, their bits of the body glowing in the dark under different laser lights in three dimensions and the pictures are are stunningly beautiful. We've had an art display um, recently in in South Yarra just to show some of these pictures off and it's discovery as well. You know there is the mind-blowing complexity of the immune system Mm. and just the workings of an individual cell internally. um, There's new stuff to discover every day and there's also the people. um, I get to work in the Peter Doherty Institute. Sometimes I get into the lift of Peter Doherty, a Nobel Prize winner. I can <laughs> chat to him. Um, and we get to travel around the world. It's a global community. I collaborate with people in Indiana, Japan, California, Boston, UK, Sweden, Minneapolis. Wow. We get to drink coffee and we usually pull out the back of a, a paper napkin and, and sketch out some science projects. Uh, and then we can make it happen. Wow. So what do you think then makes for a good scientist? You've got to have a passion for discovering new things. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a scientist needs to be objective as well. Richard Dawkins, who I don't agree with on many points, says that he likes to say he's an advocate for unbiased truth. And I think that's a a good uh, aim to have. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have a lot of integrity because whilst we're desperately seeking truth, um, we're also desperately seeking our next grant and our publications. (laughs) And there is always a compromise going on in our minds. Uh, And I find it a daily battle. How much integrity will I bring to my work and my data? Mm. And how do I feel when I've disproved yet another of my exciting hypotheses and I I have null results? So integrity, passion um, and objectivity. Uh, And also you need to be creative. Um, The best scientists uh, are coming up with new ideas. They're looking at the same data that other people see 
and they're seeing something new there and asking the right questions. Mm. I, I love asking questions, and whether it's questions about science or questions about the nature of life, uh, about the nature of reality and the universe, there are answers to these things, mm. and it's good to ask those questions. Mm. Now, popular scientist Neil deGrasse Tyson said, the good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. So do you like the objectivity and the certainty that science purports to bring? Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm a post-enlightenment rationalist thinker. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like the fact that there is a truth out there, uh, and you can talk in the realms of science about scientific truth. And we can do experiments which will get at that truth. And it's that belief that there is an objective truth there which mm. has made modern science possible in the last four to 500 years. But I think there are other categories of truth too. There's historical truth. Things either did or they didn't happen in the past. Mm. And we can actually look at the evidence and decide. I really struggle with the concept of postmodernism that there are different truths and that uh, one truth might appeal to you and another yeah. to somebody else. We don't act as postmodernists when it comes to our bank account. There well, either is money in there or not. Account. Yeah. Uh, in medicine, you know, I I've met true postmodernists who I know they've got cancer and they just don't want to accept it and they will say, well, that's a nice truth for you. But then they're turning down treatment and rejection of absolute truth leads to consequences for them. Mm. Now, you're a scientist and a researcher, but you also believe in God. Now, American scientist and atheist P.Z. Myers once gave a presentation. Scientists, if you're not an atheist, you aren't doing science right. So how do you react to a statement like that? It, it is a statement, and we need to be careful to draw the difference between an assertion and an argument. Yeah. Um, that's just an assertion, and it's not backed up by robust logical reasoning or, or argument. Yeah. Um, in Cambridge and Oxford, when I studied, I was surrounded by scientists who took both their science and their faith very seriously. I had Christian friends who are immunologists, physicists, physicians. And this week I've been reading a, a very well-informed book by Francis Collins. Yeah. Um, Francis Collins is one of the most significant scientists in the world at large today. Yeah. He was head of the Human Genome Project, yeah. entrusted with um, billions of dollars of funding, and he brought to fruition that massive collaboration. He's now the head of the National Institutes for Health in America. It's a and massive it's just, budget, yeah. He's got a budget of $32 billion per mm. year he's responsible for. And he doesn't see a conflict between science and faith. And I, I think the suggestion that he isn't doing science right mm. um, is flawed. So you don't have to be an atheist to do science right, but isn't science godless? I mean, you don't pray before doing an experiment or invoke God in the lab? <laughs> um, actually, I do sometimes pray before <laughs> experiments. Pray. Uh, I pray that I'll act with integrity, that yeah. I'll be objective, um, and that I'll make good use of the resources which have been given to me. But no, um, you don't need to pray before doing an experiment. Uh, you don't believe in God to use the approach of um, you know, rationalist, reductionist method. But I think we need to stand back and think, where did that modern scientific method come from? Mm -hmm. I mean, this, uh, isn't it a natural partner with atheism? So I, I don't think it is. I think an atheist can use it. But if you look at um, the philosophical underpinnings, where this modern scientific method arose from, it actually came from the 16th century belief that there was um, a god who was a rational creator of the universe. He created and he sustained a universe according to rational laws. And because of that, the universe and nature around us would be amenable to a rational scientific inquiry. But there was a logic underlying the universe, so the empirical scientific method would succeed. So the people who founded modern science included people like Sir Isaac Newton, Johannes Kepler, Blaise Pascal in France, Sir Francis Bacon, and in Oxford, Robert Boyle and Thomas Locke. They were all theists, and it was their theism which drove their scientific inquiry. And later that led to other great Christian thinkers like Michael Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell. Uh, and there was the motivation behind that science too. Um, you know, Sir Isaac Newton said that God is known by his works. But what drove him to use that scientific method, which we've now gifted to the atheist world, uh, was that belief that uh, God was to be known through his works, that it was worthy of study. Mm. So in some ways you're saying that there's a rational lawgiver, and so therefore we can have rational, understandable, interpretable laws in the world that we could discover through science. Very much so, yes. Uh, and it was something which troubled me as a child actually growing up and trying to work out where I stood on questions of faith. Is yeah. Could I believe in a God who I couldn't see? Um, for various reasons, I had strong reasons for, for believing in him mm -hmm. based on evidence of the lives of people I met and of the fact that as I read through 
um, the Bible. It had that ring of truth about it, and it explained things that nothing else could. Mm -hmm. So maybe just tell, tell us a bit more about your story. So when you grew up, so tell us about these people that you met, that, that you were impressed by. Yeah, so as a child growing up, I was in an environment where I met a lot of people who, who had a strong faith. And when I looked at their lives, they were normal people living ordinary lives, and often they had had quite a tough time from life. But there was something different about them, something which really attracted me to them. Mm -hmm. What was different? They, I think there were three things. They had a hope uh, which would seem to be rock solid and unshakable through yeah. life's ups and downs. And secondly, they had a joy. They, they seemed to have discovered a joy that I wanted something of and which I didn't know where it came from, but it, it, it was clear. And they had an integrity. Uh, mm -hmm. They were people who I, I found to be trustworthy and whose lives I could respect. Um, so those things drew me to, to read more about them. And as, uh, uh, what sort of circumstances were they that you saw this through, or these things? I saw people who had um, suffered from chronic depression, chronic anxiety, people who had been victims of child abuse. Mm -hmm. And as I've gone through life, I've seen people who've been persecuted for their faith. Mm -hmm. um, I think of a person I met on med medical elective in Nepal who was regularly stoned and locked up in prison for wanting to share his belief in the creator God with people around him in a country where it was illegal. Uh, but he was so full of joy. Uh, mm -hmm. I think of a Muslim woman in Uganda who had been um, kicked out of her home and was running for her life, uh, expecting to be killed if her family ever found her again, simply because she had come to trust in Jesus as her saviour. Mm -hmm. And yet she too was full of a peace and a joy which couldn't be explained by the circumstances of her life. Mm -hmm. And that impressed you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it led me to read, and um, I think a lot of scientists are readers. Um, I discovered lots of biographies in my dad's loft from his days at university, and I read stories of um, the great missionary greats like Hudson Taylor, Jonathan Goforth, and Jackie Pullinger, who headed out to the, the Far East to, um, to really risk their lives in a place where they were at risk of dying of um, malaria and um, typhoid and cholera purely so they could share what they'd discovered with people around them who they knew hadn't had that opportunity. I then went on to grapple with that real question of, of could I believe in a God who I couldn't see? Yeah. And it, it was then that I started reading uh, the writings of someone called Russell Stannard. And um, he helped me see that you wouldn't expect to find God within his creation. Well, he, was, yeah. he was a creator who had created it and he existed and was outside time and space. And then he created this universe which we live in and experience now but you don't find bits of god floating around in the universe you wouldn't expect to see him mm. was that something that drew you towards god uh, yes i think the things which attracted me most were the lives of believers i met but also um the fact that um, when i was a child of seven i started reading the bible every day yep uh, and as i read through it bit by bit it began to make more sense and i realized that there was a coherent story coming out of it which fitted with my experience of life around me. It made sense of the world around me, whether it was making sense of this universe, the origins of suffering, mm -hmm. the origins of war and conflict. And there came a point when I was 11 and I went to um, stay with a family in Germany on my own. It was my first real time away from home for a couple of weeks. And it was in that situation, living with a family who had everything. They lived in a five-story townhouse of underfloor heating and indoor swimming pools. Wow. And yet there was something missing in their lives. And I was able to stand back to look objectively and I remember coming to a realisation um, that I could only see the universe in two ways. One was the atheist explanation for science, that the universe is all there is and it's meaningless and what I did with my life would make no difference. It was just one tiny process in evolution and yeah. even if I didn't pass my genes on then I'd have achieved nothing. Yeah. And on the other hand there was the, um, the worldview held up by the Christians that I've been studying, which said that the universe was a beautiful part of creation created by a designer who wanted intimate relationship with me, who gave meaning and purpose to my life, and who gave order to the universe and sustained it. And I remember wrestling that week, uh, particularly at nights in my thoughts, which did I, I think was most true? And I think I ended up coming to the thinking of someone called Blaise Pascal, who I didn't know about at the time. You may have heard of Pascal's Wager. He says that if you're faced with that choice between a meaningless, godless universe and the universe of God, then it's safer to err on the side of going with the God hypothesis because it has such important implications yes. for our lives. Because uh, if the negative hypothesis or if there's no God, then it doesn't matter it doesn't anyway. Matter in any way, you can make the. So even if it's true, it doesn't actually make any difference. Yeah. Or it doesn't have any eternal implications. I didn't know it at the time, but Blaise Pascal, a 16th century philosopher in France, was saying that there's a God-shaped gap in each of us, yeah. uh, which is yearning to be filled. 
Uh, and that's what I chose to do when I was 11. My story didn't end there. Over the next few years, I then really wanted to test out rigorously, well, what is the evidence for God? Yeah. And so I, I read and read, and I come to the strong conviction that there's the, the scientific worldview I depend on every day in my work is entirely compatible with a creator mm. God out there. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 1960s, after Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin made the first voyage in space, the leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, made the comment, Gagarin flew into space and didn't see any God there. So what was wrong with Khrushchev's conception of God? Yeah, well, American broadcaster Paul Harvey at the same time made this suggestion. He said if he had just stepped outside his spacecraft, he would have met God. <laughs> That's a bit of a brutal way of putting it, though, I suppose. <laughs> but it shows that two people can look at the same reality and the same data and come to different conclusions. Yeah. Khrushchev saw no God. Uh, so Yuri Gagarin saw no God, and Khrushchev concluded that God couldn't be seen in space. Uh, but in, in the Christian worldview, there, there's no suggestion that God can physically be seen in space. More that space is like the handiwork of a great painter and that traces of creative genius are there written mm. on the canvas throughout it. You know, God's not part of his creation. That would be what we call pantheism or animism or paganism. That's still a worldview which holds sway in many places, but it's not yeah. consistent with the beliefs of those enlightenment founders of modern science that I've talked about. And when I look out into space, it's something I love doing in Australia because your skies are so dark and you can see the Pleiades, that's a star cluster, you can see about 21 visible stars, but there are several hundred there. Yeah. I'm looking out through billions of years of space time and you get a sense of the immensity of the universe. Mm. And if you're Khrushchev and you look out at that immensity and see nothing but emptiness drifting off into a cold infinity, that's a deeply depressing thought. Mm. If Doesn't you look out and you see the handiwork of a creator who's place those stars and designed and upholds the laws of physics which sustain them. It's an amazingly awe-inspiring thought to know that you can actually know that person. Mm. But it can still be depressing, but it can still be true. Uh, it could be, but um, I think before we get too depressed, um, we should weigh up the evidence. Well, one of the ways we could weigh up the evidence is perhaps by considering the Bible, because today's big question is, why can't I see God? And perhaps surprisingly, the Bible also offers an answer. In the Gospel of John, one of the four biographies of Jesus' life that we have, John says in chapter 1, 18, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Now, Tim, this passage says that no one has ever seen God. So do you think that the Bible expects, as you've said, that you won't be able to see God through a microscope or a telescope? That's right. I'll come back to the analogy of the art gallery I walked around the other day. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a, a range of paintings by Van Gogh, which are vivid in their power of the, the, um, the colours and the forms that he's put on the canvas. But I don't find God or Van Gogh in those paintings. But right at the end of the um, exhibition, the very last picture you see is a self-portrait of Van Gogh. He's painted himself into that exhibition and suddenly you get a sense of who he is. Um, or to put it differently, in cinema, there are many uh, great film directors who have cameo roles in their films. Yeah. Famously, Alfred Hitchcock, also Martin Scorsese and Quentin Tarantino. You can learn a lot about their creative genius by watching their films, but it's only when they appear in the film, they write themselves into that script, that you can actually know them personally. The Christian worldview would claim that God has done just that. He's created a universe, and it's clear from looking down a microscope or through a telescope that the God behind it must be powerful and a genius, but it's only when he writes himself into the script of the play, when he paints his own portrait, when he turns up on the scene, that we can actually know him face to face. And the incredible claim of the Bible is that God did that in the form of Jesus. Mm. And 2,000 years ago, I may not be able to see God now, but if I'd been there in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, I would have been able to meet him face to face. And that means that there is Oh, so and that's what this passage is saying here, isn't it? That the, no one's ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who he himself is God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So in some ways, this is saying that the one and only Son here, who's Jesus, has kind of written himself into the story. Is that right? Absolutely. It's just like God himself is playing a cameo role. He turned up in the person of Jesus. Jesus makes these incredible claims that he is God in human form. And by knowing him, we can know God. Mm. Now, I suppose the final part of my personal um, story of how I came to my current position is that when I was 18 I went to Cambridge University and there I met someone called Bernard Palmer who, who said something I'll never forget. Yeah. He said that he was academically convinced that Jesus Christ was a real historical figure 
who died and rose again. And that made me sit up and think. I suddenly realised that historical truth was another category of truth I hadn't ever grasped before, yeah. and that the claims of the Christian worldview could actually be tested by looking at the historical evidence for and against the existence, uh, death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, no serious historians of the ancient world doubt the existence of Jesus. His impact and his historical attestation are too clear and thorough for that. The question is, when we look at the original manuscript documents of the eyewitness accounts, do they have that ring of truth? Are they internally coherent? Are they consistent with each other? Uh, and do they lead us to the conclusion that this uh, man, Jesus Christ, really was the man he claimed to be, or just some lunatic? And that's something which I then went on to, to think through deeply the last 20 years. So there are many historical manuscripts, and you can weigh those up for yourself. And that was what I did at university. I went away, I took Bernard Palmer's um, comment seriously, and I, I looked at the evidence as deeply as I could. I took a summer, I happened to be in Uganda, and I took the thickest books I could find on the subject, <laughs> and I read them through. And I came back sharing his conviction that I was academically convinced. Now, we learn a bit, a bit more about how God has made himself known in another New Testament book of Hebrews. The author says to begin the book, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. How does this help us answer if God can be seen? So this, um, this quotation directly addresses the question of, of how is God known? Yeah. Okay. Is he seen down a microscope? Certainly not in my lab. No. Um, the, the worldview of the writer here is saying God is made known when he chooses to reveal himself. Yeah. Francis Bacon was a great philosopher of the Enlightenment and one of the founding fathers of modern science. And he said uh, these words, which were then quoted by Charles Darwin himself on the title page of his Origin of Species. And I quoted in my thesis as well. Let no man think or maintain that anyone can search too far or be too well studied in the book of God's words or in the book of God's works. Rather, let all endeavour and endless progress or proficiency in both. God reveals himself in two ways. There's the book of his works, that's nature which we can study through science, and the book of his words, that's the Bible and the historical record of Jesus' time on earth. Same, but in the past he spoke through prophets mm -hmm. with direct revelation from God uh, in various different ways. But now he's spoken to us supremely in the person of Jesus. Like that film director Alfred Hitchcock writing his cameo role in, God has stepped into the world in the person of Jesus to make him known. And it's when we get to know Jesus better that we know God better. Mm. So the author goes on then to say more about Jesus, the Son of God, in the next verse. In verse 3, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So what does this then say about the role of God in the universe? This says that God is not the God of the gaps. Okay? The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That's saying when we look at Jesus, we can know what God is like. Mm -hmm. But when it says that he sustains all things by his powerful word, um, this little passage from Hebrews is making an extraordinary claim. God isn't seen in the things we don't understand and, and can't make sense of. He's seen in the normal day-to-day -day events of nature, such as the sun's rising and its setting. Uh, yes, the Bible says that God creates the world, but it also says that he continues to sustain the universe. Mm. God doesn't just do the bits we can't explain. He does, he does the bits that we can. You know, Bible writers say that God sends the rain, but even 3,000 years ago, within the Bible, we know that those biblical writers knew of the existence of the water cycle. They understood how the water could rise from the sea under the influence of the sun, fall on the mountains and return to the sea and the river. Yeah. They attributed that both to science and to God. The fact that it continued to do that was because the laws of physics were sustained by that God who had created the universe. In a book called Acts, chapter 17, Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. You know, the God of the Bible maintains the existence of the laws of physics. There's a lovely quote from Stephen Hawking who says, what is it that breathes life into these equations and makes there a universe to exist? When I look at the laws of physics, they are just descriptions of God's usual activity in this universe. They yeah. describe how things happen, but they don't ever begin to explain why they happen or what makes them happen, mm. where the universe comes from, why it continues to exist, why... Uh, particles continue to repel each other, why gravity continues to attract us to distant stars across the other side of the universe. What is it but breathes fire into those equations which describe this universe? And uh, the answer of Hebrews would be that it's God's creating and sustaining power which does that. Mm. It's an incredible claim. It is an incredible claim. So perhaps you could say that even 
if God is sustaining all things by his powerful word, the atheist scientist, when they're doing science, is in some ways benefiting from God's sustaining power, perhaps? It's a theistic exercise? Uh, absolutely. Um, if God exists, then we all depend on him for our existence every day, whether or not we acknowledge him. But as life is short and death is certain, I think it's important that we do stand back and just ask ourselves once or twice as an adult, uh, have I really looked closely enough into these questions, whether God exists? So in some ways, what this is saying, the sustaining all things by his powerful word, is the cradle of science, the birthplace of science, perhaps? I would say so, and it's become such a powerful tool that it can now be put into the hands of people who don't stop to consider the philosophy behind it at all, which is exciting. And it just shows the, the truth of the, um, the method, that it is getting at an external reality, objective truth, which is out there. That's why I don't work alongside postmodernists. They don't do science. <laughs> so, Tim, why can't we see God? So to sum up, um, we can't see God because he's not here in his universe, he's outside creation. In the 1930s, there was a great debate in Europe and across the globe as to whether the universe had always been and always would be. The steady state theory proposed um, by many people and, and the last major proponent of it was someone called Fred Hoyle. But we discovered the, the final piece of evidence, the cosmic background radiation, which showed that the Big Bang theory, which was coined by Fred Hoyle as a term of contempt, was actually true. The universe had had a beginning. Time and space had had a beginning. That's entirely consistent with the Christian worldview, which said God always was and is, but then he created at a specific point in time. He created time itself and space itself. Uh, we're not going to see God within that universe, but if, if I look at a, a, an amazing universe, it gives me echoes of the creator behind it. And there's also a sense, though, we can see God because he has spoken and revealed himself, most ultimately in Jesus. Very much so. And that's why we chose to look at these particular verses, that uh, that claim that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Let me leave you with the Bible's answer to the big question, why can't I see God? From John 1, 18. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. I look forward to you joining us next time for Bigger Questions. Many thanks to our guest today, Dr. Tim Hinks. Thanks so much. Enjoy Bigger Questions? You can help us keep asking them for as little as $1 a podcast. Support the show. Go to patreon.com slash biggerquestions.